For the wartime newsreel cameras, the dancers wore gas masks. But the Germans never used gas against British civilians. Hitler's weapon against British civilians was bombs. Over two million homes were damaged, blasted, gutted. And beginning with London, whole cities were hammered. Fire and high explosives probed and tested the strength of the British way of life. In November 1940, the Germans shifted their attack from London. The first provincial city they hit hard was Coventry. The heart was torn out of a cathedral, out of a city. People were bewildered, and their leaders were bewildered too, by the huge fires. On paper, Birmingham, Nuneaton, Rugby should have come to the aid of Coventry, which they did, in fact. But on arrival here, they found that the couplings on the fire engine were dissimulated, malle up. And it meant, therefore, that cooperation broke down completely. Of course, in addition to that, you've got 360 fractures on the gas main and all the other services went. All the water supplies were disconnected. If the farmer wanted to uh, find sources, they simply were not there. The king visited Coventry, with him the Home Secretary. Herbert Morrison came here, and the military folk wanted to establish martial law, and we had a stand-up fight on this. Alderman Bill Alliwell and myself said, no, this must be a civic exercise. The, the uh, pressure was taken off, and virtually he and I, plus the regional officers, conducted operation from then on. They were, virtually seven weeks dictatorship. You see, there was nothing on the textbooks of civilian defence to indicate the local authorities how to behave in an emergency calamity situation such as we found on the morning of November the uh, 15th. While Morrison, the Home Secretary, strove to correct the muddle by creating Britain's first national fire service, Volunteers shored up the crumbling home front. Fresh evacuation hurried the children away as city after city passed through crisis. Portsmouth, Southampton, Sheffield, Bristol, Glasgow. Then Plymouth became the worst hit city with seven big raids in March and April 1941. A quarter of its people, 50,000 trekkers, fled the city at night and slept out in the hills. This film was not shown in wartime Britain. The censored press could only hint at chaos. 
30,000 people lost their homes, and many lost much more. Well, when the sounds went, it was somewhere around nine o'clock, I think. I called my mother and she came down the stairs. She said, I'll take Raymond. I said, all right, I'll take Sheila. And we called Mrs. Top, that was the lady upstairs. And she came down with her three children. And uh, we went in our respective covers. And I sat on a little tiny chair and I put Raymond at my side. And um, I held Sheila in my arms. And after that, I, I didn't know anything. I must have come to in the cupboard because I heard my father say, oh, I'm afraid your mother's had it. And then I said, oh, Sheila's all right. She's in my arms. And I went to touch my other child and I couldn't feel him. And I must have lost consciousness again because I was bathed, I believe. Later I learned that my mother was dead and and the two children were, and Mrs. Trott was killed, and her two children. She was expecting a baby any hour. Mrs. Vance's husband, a sailor, came home on leave next morning. There was her mother laying on the bed in the front room. We went across the road to her brother's place. He told me where they had the two children. I went up where they were. Cold. Not a blemish on him. That's when I lost my temper. I said, instead of us <coughs> dropping bloody paper, I said, we ought to be hitting them the same as they're hitting us. Well, Mr. McGee, after all this, what do you think about us going over to Berlin and doing the same to them? I should think so, too. A bit worse than this, I hope, with a wicked bugger like he is. I definitely do, sir. Bum them tenfold. I'm sorry for the women and children of Berlin, but what about the women and children of this country? This is what the authorised newsreels did show of Plymouth. Churchill's voice and presence did sustain morale. And in Cabinet, he knew how to get his way. And if Henry V said now, gentlemen, I've been into all this thing, and the channel is um, very tricky at the moment, and we can't get the reinforcements. The rate of sickness can't be re can't be uh, replaced. The um, bridgehead, according to Hemley's infantry tactics, is too small. And uh, in short, I feel that there's nothing else but to launch an attack upon half. But he didn't say that. He said once more unto the breach, dear friends. Well, Winston had that extraordinary power. But Churchill's speeches rang less true these days. Almost worse than bombing, U-boat attacks on merchant shipping cut Britain's food supplies. The Germans were on the rampage everywhere. We cannot tell what the course of this fell war will be as it spreads remorseless to ever wider regions. We know it will be hard. We expect it will be long. We cannot yet see how deliverance will come or when it will come. But nothing is more certain than that every trace of Hitler's footsteps, every stain of his infected and corroding fingers will be sponged and purged and if need be blasted from the surface of the earth. He may spread his course far and wide and carry his curse with him. He may break into Africa or into Asia, but it is with us here in this island fortress that he will have to reckon and settle in the end. Walk to pay. Walk to pay. Walk. Now beholding me an LDV for battle, I'm just yearning, doing my best like all the rest to keep the home fires burning. Each evening, stiff and starch, up and down the street I march. I'm guarding the home of the home guard, guarding the home.
the home guard's home All day long, steady and strong Doing what I'm told and I can't go wrong All the ladies are fond of me But last night one of them gave a shout When she saw me pulling my bayonet out While guarding the home guard's home The home guard had been founded a year before On exercises its members played at fighting You were a new call a call with its traditions to make. But you have already got your motto. And your motto is, kill the Bosch. In the course of your duty, you may have the luck to come in contact with the enemy. If you do, one of your duties is to shoot when you see a sitter. And shoot to kill. The British still lived in fear, not just of invasion, but of the foe at home. Fear of listening spies. And fear of enemy aliens. In the summer of 1940, the press had screamed, in turn the lot. And almost all of them, Germans, Austrians, refugee Jews, left-wing exiles, had passed through verminous transit camps, interned without trial. I was interned just like that, you know, fetched by the police without knowing anything beforehand. Two policemen came and fetched me. Although they did not know it, they were bound for Liverpool for embarkation. People standing, lining the streets, you know, and throwing stones at you, spitting at you, shouting spies, you know. And uh, that was horrible. Everyone thought, well, it will be a concentration camp like it is in Austria or in Germany. And we were brought on that boat, and several of them wanted to jump into the water, you know, because they didn't know what is in front of them. And we arrived on the Isle of Man. We had the pictures taken first, of course, with our number on. So we had already the feeling, well, we are criminals. But from that moment on, it was much, much better. We had quite nice people to look after us. And we had more security. We had so much security that we were fenced in even. Aliens had the right of appeal to tribunals, and by 1941, many were free. But a new threat to civil liberty had loomed. Regulation 2D. Because Stalin was still in alliance with Hitler, the British Communist Party opposed the war effort. Under 2D, its paper, The Daily Worker, had been banned. But five months later, when Hitler struck at Russia, Churchill himself seized the chance to be Stalin's ally. Germany's new thrust east took the pressure off Churchill's battered island. There was time now to perfect the new and truly total war economy. But at its head in the coalition government were two jealous rivals. Big men brought in from outside Parliament. Max Beaverbrook, the newspaper baron, now Minister of Supply, and Ernest Bevin, the strong man of the TUC. For Bevin, the industrial workers were his people. Well, mates, Ever since we took office, we have been exhorting you to work hard. I've never done so much an exhortation to work hard in my life. But we've got to do it to win this victory. We'll all go along together with a mighty effort and show to the Hitlers and Mussolinis that we can not only work and fight but we can be cheerful in doing it as well. Uh, Ernie Bevin, you see, is an Englishman to the fingertips and with a great hold over the trade unions and the labor movement as a whole. I think he's the most conceited man that I've ever known. Uh, it happens to self-made men very often. But the great thing about Ernie is that he never went back on what he said. And uh, he said to his civil, I said it, didn't I? 
And that, was, and that is a tremendous thing. He was very loyal in those ways. Very likable man. And one day, we were fighting for a rather technical point, the extraction of wheat in the loaf. And they were trying to get it up to 88% extraction. And Ernie suddenly said in the committee, he said, uh, I say that the middle of this loaf is indigestible. You can't eat it, so wait. Oh, there you are. What did I tell you? Churchill grew in admiration of the great fundamental qualities of Bevan, his single purposeness and the obvious desire, determination on the part of Bevin to suppress all party political considerations. Imagine the power he had. He was in charge of the possibilities of service for everybody in the civilian life of this country. <laughs> he had total powers over every man working and over every woman. From March 1941, Bevin began to direct women into vital work. And into vital work, the pretty girls went. But not enough of them. So in December, Britain went further than any fighting land had ever done, and further than the Germans could ever go. Conscription of women was announced. Girls called up could choose between the women's services or war work in the fields or factories. Unity final work of the day this morning on rhythmic record. I suppose you'll be leaving us shortly. Yes, I think I will. Think I'll give the land down a try? Do you think you'll like that? Yes, the life rather appeals to me. Don't think any of us want to start there. Whatever happens, dear? What am I going to do about my hair? I can't possibly come down the country. Oh, well then, I suggest you wear it straight. I hit this. I'd like to help to build Spitfires. My boy's in the RAS. Well, and I feel I'm helping him. The sooner we all pull together in this thing, the sooner it will be over. I myself would like to go in the services because it's the uniform that appeals. While Bevin's concern was long-term efficiency, Beaverbrook reveled in short-term frenzies. Now he was calling for tanks. We want tanks. We want very many tanks. We want them for the defense of our island and also for offensive operations. Beaverbrook's flamboyant methods outraged his colleagues and even his loyal friend Churchill was troubled by Beaverbrook's moods, by his resignations and by his quarrels with Bevin. Well, Max Beaverbrook did a, a very good crash job. But in my opinion, and, and I'm biased, he left behind a, an enormous quantity of uh, wreckage, of administrative wreckage. And he said... War is a matter of improvisation. Organization is the enemy of improvisation. Ernie Bevan, domineering, dogmatic, even tyrannical, could be ruthless. Don't stand in my way. Don't criticize me. I will tolerate no interrogation from any source. Beaverbrook the same. Same. Two strong personalities, domineering and ruthless. Early in 1942, Beaverbrook flounced out after only two weeks in a new job, boss of war industry, minister of production. For convincing reasons, Bevin had finally won. Well, I think he won because Churchill 
had the sense, the common sense, to realise it was good to have the trade union movement on his side. He wasn't. He didn't throw Beaverbrook overboard. Don't forget, Beaverbrook was out and in and out and in. And finally out. This time he stayed out. A visit to Russia, where he'd been welcomed by Britain's ambassador, Sir Stafford Cripps, had convinced him that the delightful Stalin was a great man. The Russians had been pressing a reluctant British government to start a second front in Europe. Out of office, Beaverbrook flung himself into a campaign for the second front, building on Britain's almost mystical admiration for the Red Army. We believe in the skill of the Russian generals. We believe in the equipment of the Russian divisions. And we believe in the fighting power and the courage of the Russian soldiers. And this is the day to proclaim our faith. Weapons we must give and raw materials. Bread we must give and sugar too. Men we must give. Equipped with tanks and with airplanes. That is a pledge of the Second Front. Also, cheering Beaverbrook on, Britain's Communist Party now backed the war. Their leaders were calling on the workers to make their war production mightier yet. No one calls for the Second Front without being personally prepared to place their being, their energy, and every ounce of fight they possess at the disposal of the government. There is a full understanding of what is meant and the people of this country are quite rightly beginning to resent this war on the cheap, this one-way war that's going on where it's the Russians that do the dying and the fighting and the sacrifice while we pay tributes to them from the benches of the House of Commons. But one left-winger on those benches, Cripps, had just returned from his stint in Moscow. Many people saw him as a possible rival for Churchill. His views on Russia had vast appeal. We've got to try and help the Russians in every way that we can to make ready to meet the spring offensive of Hitler. I appreciate there are some people in this country who are still afraid of the spread of the Russian ideology. But what they've got to recollect is that if we are friendly with Russia and have an arrangement of cooperation with them, any dangers which they fear will be very much less. As a matter of fact, the Soviet Union have no idea and no wish to interfere with the internal affairs of any other country. I know that from the lips of Stalin himself. Again in the headlines. Disaster was stacked on defeat. The press was worried and critical, especially the Daily Mirror, which ran a scalding campaign against profiteers. One cartoon was too much for Churchill. The price of petrol has been increased by one penny, official. Churchill told Morrison to stop the paper, but the rest of the press rallied to the Mirror's support, led by the young editor of Beaverbrook's Evening Standard, Michael Foote. The liberty of the press in this country can only be maintained by the vigilance of the people and the vigilance of Parliament and the courage of the newspapers themselves. That's the only way. Therefore, we must fight, fight, fight to retain those liberties. The ministers come along and tell us, have told us in the last two or three weeks, of course, it's only the Daily Mirror they were trying to get at. The attack is over, they say. No more demands on any other newspapers. All other newspapers may continue to live in tranquility and in freedom and in peace. There's something rather familiar about those words. <laughs> I have no more territorial demands. I can picture in my mind's eye now 
Mr. Morrison himself, muttering those words, I have no more territorial demands. <laughs> Coming down Shoe Lane with a firm look on his jaw and a hot gun in his pocket with the evening standard safely suppressed under 2D and its proprietor safely looked after under 18B. The only man who thought it was going to be shut down was Churchill. And when it was brought up in the House of Commons, on the whole, the House of Commons uh, came out on the side of the mirror, more or less. They didn't like the mirror, but they weren't going to have it suppressed. Uh, and after that, well, we trimmed ourselves a bit, and the government uh, forgot their foolishness. Since democratic life did go on, there were still by-elections. The coalition government lost a string of them to independence. Tom Dryberg stood at Malden as an independent socialist. Malden was a very safe Tory seat. I hadn't the faintest idea of how to be a candidate. I didn't belong to any party, didn't know the electoral law or anything. First, I went to see my employer, Lord Beaverbrook, who, uh, whom I was working for at the time on the Daily Express. and. Uh, he was a bit sceptical. He said the only advice he would give me was uh, that I must wear a hat. He said the British people will never vote for a man who doesn't wear a hat. Then in June came a fresh shock from Africa. Tobruk fell about three or four days before polling day in the election. We rushed out a leaflet headed tragedy at Tobruk, and it was a tragedy, and we felt it as such. But nonetheless, I'm bound to admit that that did probably greatly add to the number of votes which we got. Dryberg won by a huge majority. Meanwhile, the rebel MPs of all parties wanted a showdown with Churchill. And when Tobruk fell in 1942, Churchill was in Washington. And um, the American press carried alarmist reports of the state of the government at home and the possible votes of censure and so on. So much so that Winston rang me up. It was about 5 a.m. our time, I suppose about midnight his time, uh, to, to uh, ask uh, what was happening. Was the government still in office and what was going on and so forth? Uh, and I was able to tell him, so far as I knew, nothing had happened except that this motion had been tabled, which we'd have to take. Churchill came back to confront a House of Commons motion expressing no confidence in his leadership. It even seemed to the rebels that they might win. They muffed it. As so often with these great parliamentary debates, there's a bit of an anticlimax when you get there. And in this case, the anticlimax came instantly in the opening speech by this ineffable old Tory, Sir John Wardlaw Milne, because he made this fantastic suggestion that there should be a supreme commander of all the armed forces who should be, and he named him, none other than the Duke of Gloucester, whom God preserve. But uh, there was a, a roar of laughter and a howl of disappointment. And in gales of derision, the motion was swept away. There were only 25 votes against Churchill. And now the war news began to grow brighter. The Germans were held up at Stalingrad. Britain won in November at El Alamein. Churchill went north to Bradford in sprightly spirits. Now uh, we have uh, just passed through the month of November, usually a month of fogs and gloom. But on the whole, a month I've liked a good deal better than some other months we've seen during the course of this present unpleasantness. And so I say to you, let us go forward together and put these grave matters to the proof. Churchill was safe in power while the war lasted. But the hopes of the British people were swinging away from him, beyond victory, what could Churchill offer them? By 
But by the middle of the war, there weren't so many barrels. If you wanted beer, you might have to bring your own bottle. And many other things which people had relied on were now in short supply. Apples and razors, prams and potatoes, bread and offal were all unrationed. But you had to queue. And because they hated queuing, people welcomed rationing. Soap and clothes were rationed as well as most essential foodstuffs. You knew you could get the ration without fail, and the British system seemed fair enough, the same for everyone, rich or poor. Each person got up to eight ounces of sugar a week, every two months a packet of dried eggs, eight ounces of cheese a week, eight ounces of fats, four ounces of bacon, and about a pound of meat. Are you helping to win the war on the kitchen front? If you are saving our shipping uh, by making the most of what we grow at home, if you are growing vegetables on every bit of ground that you can get hold of, if you are only eating what you need and not what you'd like and as much as you'd like, then you are helping to win the war. And my advice to you is cook potatoes in their jackets and grow your own onions. And they did, assailed by a barrage of films and posters. After war work, before fire watching, in between spells of home guard training, townsmen toiled on their allotments. Britain was under blockade. By 1943, farmers had brought nearly four and a half million extra acres of grassland under the plough and allotments were chewing up scraps of good land left over. Vegetables flourished round the Albert Memorial. Good, plain food was still cheap and unrationed in factory canteens and in the new publicly owned British restaurants, but many people complained that the rich could still find fancier titbits. The black market snaked silently through Britain. Poor fella. Now, what can I sell his mother? I want to talk to you about what is called racketeering, or the black market. It is being stopped. These food cheats are the enemies of the people. And there must be no dirty fingers in the people's food. The ugly squander bug, symbol of waste, was outlawed. Women were reminded not to waste old clothes and not to ask for glamorous new ones. Every scrap of manufactured matter counted. Fashion is rationed. Roughly speaking, the rot set in when silk stockings had to be sacrificed in the early stages of the war. That was pre-austerity. By the way, did you realize the difference between austerity and utility? Austerity on the left is the elder sister of utility, which you see in the checked suit, and austerity was allowed many fashionable privileges denied to utility. For instance, pleats. Utility, as you know, is confined to four, whereas austerity was lavish with pleats. Strict petrol allocation drove many cars off the road, though some drivers ran on cold gas. Trains and buses were scarce now, too. You'll wonder why we make a fuss if George decides to take a bus. But look again and you will see that George ain't all that George should be. He's only got a step to go, a couple of hundred yards or so whilst others further down the queue have far to go and lots to do. When George gets on, we often find that other folk get left behind. He pays his fare and rides a stage, and off he hops. And see the rage. And seeing this gives George a jog. Perhaps 
I'm just a transport hog. Hello, Forces. Once again, this is Joan Griffith saying thank you for your... The BBC, official voice of Britain, was more high-minded than ever, but the public didn't mind. The Brains Trust, a weekly intellectual forum, was one of the radio's most popular programs. And the voice of the novelist, J.B. Priestley, made him a major star. The British were absolutely at their best in the Second World War. They were as, never as good, certainly in my lifetime, before it. And I'm sorry to say <laughs> that they've never been quite as good after it. Because a large number of people were living more intensely than they'd ever done before, a large number of people equally felt they needed some of the arts. De Myra Hess played in the National Gallery. There was a greater demand, I think, for good books, good plays, music, sight of some good pictures, than I'd ever known before in this country. But still more people loved High Gang and that man, Tommy Handley. It marked. If it isn't Canteen Claire or the Russell Smacking Bomber. <laughs> I say, you look a bit tousled. Have you thrown off the handle? No, sir. I've been fire watching for the first time. <laughs> Do you have a chaperone? Oh, yes, sir. And a very nice, polite chap he was, too. <laughs> Always said pardon before he took his boots off. <laughs> I can hate to hear what he said before he took his socks off. <laughs> and Gracie Fields was back. I'm the girl that makes the thing that drills the hole that holds the spring that drives the rod that turns the knob that works the thing of me bob. I'm the girl that makes the thing that holds the oil that oils the ring that takes the shank that moves the crank that works the thing of me bob. It's a ticklish sort of job making a thing for a thing of me bob, especially when you don't know what it's for, and I don't know. But I'm the girl that makes the thing that. Drills the hole that holds the spring that makes the thing a me bob that makes the engines roar. And I'm the girl that makes the thing that holds the oil that oils the ring that makes the thing a me bob that's going to win the war. Tis true. <laughs> Aircraft production had trebled in two years, and the next two it doubled again. By now, Britain's war economy was much more widely based and thoroughly organized than Germany's. But the cost of such concentrated effort was high. Familiar customs in industry were swept aside. Workers put in massive overtime, which stretched mind and body to the limit. Then, sometimes, their patience snapped. This is Betzhanger, Kent scene of a famous dispute in 1942. Industry cried out for coal, but output fell and went on falling. Many miners had joined up or had found better paid work. Older men worked longer hours and had to guard the mine as well. But when they could stand these conditions no more, they struck. We all uh, marched down into Deal and then down to the Canterbury Road. Well, there were several of the local residents and uh, particularly some of the troops they were jeering and sneering at us but little did they know that the, at the time that we we were manning this pit 24 hours a day with the home guard troops ourselves and many of us worked and stopped at the pit here 24 hours a day the miners knew strikes were forbidden by bevin by a wartime regulation order 1305 
But faced with the solid body of a thousand men, you couldn't jail them all or even collect the fines, and Bevan and Churchill knew it. I don't think Churchill wanted us to go to prison. He wanted us to stay here and guard his property, because it was his property after all. It wasn't ours. The government gave in. Desperate for labor, late in 1943, Bevin called up boys, not for the forces, for the mines. Now you'll be here for a week. Is there any particular district you'd like to go to at the end of your training? Rose over Derby. Right. Now will you pass down there to the bulletin section, please? Well, if you have a good job, see the job. Don't be frightened when they drop in on them. We'll tell you how. Seven a quarter, please. Seven a quarter. One new national serviceman in ten became a Bevin boy. You couldn't escape whoever your dad was. They tell me you're a public school boy. It'll be a bit of a change for you going in the mine, won't it? Yes, it will, but I feel as though it's a necessity that someone's got to do the job, and so I think uh, I'm doing my part in, in uh, helping. I was expecting to go into the army, and, uh, of course, I was very shocked when I heard on the news on Christmas Day that I was to be directed into the mines. Uh, it was a ballot actually, and they drew out numbers ending in naught or nine. My registration number ended in naught, because there's no ducking away from that. Consequently, I had to go in the mines regardless of anything. His parents hoped he'd be an army officer. Oh, they were flabbergasted. <laughs> and if somebody had said to me six months sooner that you're going into the mines, I should have thought they were joking. But lads of 17, without a mining background, couldn't solve the problem. Output went on falling and falling. And in 1944, in Yorkshire and South Wales, over 200,000 miners came out on unofficial strike. The men have worked continuously for a period of nearly five years under war conditions, suffering from a deep sense of grievance because they have not been rewarded by the state equally with ex-mine workers employed in government factories. In the bustling Tyneside shipyards, as in the mines, men who remembered mass unemployment feared the peace. Their doubts and wishes spoke out even in government-made documentary films. Tyneside's busy enough today. Oldens and young'uns hard at work making good ships. But just remember what the yards looked like five years ago. Idle. Empty. Some of them derelict. And the skilled men that worked in them scattered and forgotten. Will it be the same again five years from now? Other films echoed the same question like this early effort by the Bolting Brothers, starring Bernard Miles. Oh, you reckon Hitler's made a lot on us change our minds a bit lately? We made a fine big war effort. Well, when it's all over, we've got to see to it. We make a fine big peace effort. There's no two ways about it. Won't go back now. We made a start. Sure. Look at that Dunkirk. Wasn't no unemployed there. Every man had a job to do, and he'd done it. And that's what we got to see they has in peacetime. A job. Ah, and they'll be work enough too when this lot's over. Building up something new and better than what's been destroyed. There mustn't be no more chaps hanging around for work what don't come. No more slums, neither. No more dirty, filthy back streets. And no more half-starved kids with no room to play in. We can't go back to the old way of living. At least ways not all of it. That's gone forever. And the sooner we all make up our minds about that, the better. We gotta all pull together. Well, there was a great community spirit during the war. It is the nearest thing that I've seen in my lifetime to the operation of a kind of a socialist state, that is, of a democratic socialist state of citizens believing that they could have influenced by their actions speedily what was going to be done and that the whole world could be changed by the way they operated. They saw that the world was changed by their actions in the war and they thought that could be translated into 
political action as well. It was extremely exciting, but some of the political leaders, maybe because they were so deeply involved in their own pursuits, uh, didn't appreciate what was happening. And so, the people's hopes for a better peace fixed themselves on Sir William Beveridge, who had been commissioned by the government to draw up plans for a welfare state. When his report was published in 1942, it was a bestseller. The report proposes, first, an all-in scheme of social insurance, providing for all citizens and their families all the cash benefits needed for security, in return for a single weekly contribution by one insurance stamp. It preserves the maximum of individual freedom and responsibility that is consistent with the abolition of want. The government first blew hot, then cold, very cold. Churchill wouldn't act. And Churchill got very worried, and his two chancellors of the Exchequer, Sir Kingsley Wood and uh, Anderson, were equally critical. And that's why the beverage plan was delayed after my bill. That's why education came first. A major reform of education would tread on fewer big toes. It had other uses too. It wasn't really very controversial. It was very long. And Churchill realized here was a wonderful way of exercising the troops, you see. Churchill was first and foremost a war leader. He kept the brakes on reconstruction. But Churchill didn't take much interest, frankly. He wanted to know whether we were going to go in for nationalization. And we had a proposal by Herbert Morrison to nationalize the electricity industry. And that's where the coalition government stopped. We couldn't get agreement on that. A new party, Commonwealth, called for beverage now and won two by-elections. Other independents took up the cry. The beverage bandwagon rolled on. Early in 1944, West Derbyshire had its say. One candidate was wholly independent. Indeed, he had no program at all. I have no animosity to the other two candidates. If I am not elected, I am the only one that has anything to lose. I am very proud that what I consider to be the foundation stone of true democracy has been well and truly laid in the village of Knifton, Derbyshire, England. Goodall then fled back to his father's cottage and the real fight was between an independent socialist, Charlie White, who had Commonwealth support and the youthful conservative, Lord Hartington, who had official Labour backing. Hartington's family had always found a seat round here, and to reject him would be most untraditional. But White won by a landslide. Conservatives were not pleased. Democracy, however, was safe enough for the fascist leader Mosley to be released. He had been interned since 1940. The government said that he was ill, but very few people believed it. This caused the greatest public uproar of the war years. Fear and hatred had changed their targets. Released aliens were serving in the Pioneer Corps. On the newsreels, they now appeared as lovable allies. This is Corporal Drucker. His scars and his glass eye are the legacy of being kicked by a horse when he was in a crack Austrian cavalry regiment. The uh, dragoons, wasn't it, Drucker? Yes, sir. I was kicked twice. Once by a horse and once by Shigrikova. I prefer the horse. Alien troops of myriad nations were welcomed now in Britain, where they gathered to prepare for the D-Day invasion. The free Poles conquered many Scottish hearts. The GIs were everywhere. One, two, three, four. They were 
were well equipped, well paid, and they gave the girls fine new things like nylons and the jitterbug. Churchill could now inspect an army which knew that it would win. The hour of our greatest effort and action is approaching. We march with valiant allies who count on us as we count on them. The only homeward road for all of us lies through the arch of victory. At last the day came. And it was sweet. Wally Hammond's cover drive delighted crowds who basked serenely in the fine high summer weather. Britain seemed close to the winning post. Wasn't it all over, bar the killing? Thanks to the very fine weather in the uh, Straits of Dover, all holiday crowds apparently had a good time, except those rash enough to travel. Is the favorite winning? Ah, who cares anyway? V1. Plane with no pilot. kind of weapon. A new kind of war. Time to hide again. 